Thanks so much, Vicky. Um, <clears throat> I should speak into this. Can everyone hear me at the back? Is that better, a bit better? OK, great. Um, yeah, academics can be such wankers, can't we? <laughs> uh, so it, the term is permapoesis, and it comes from looking at, uh, well, really just broken down. Um, it, it, it really means permanent making. I should have just said that, really. Um, but yeah, from the Latin poesis, meaning to make. Um, but as a poet, um, I sort of started this journey as a visual artist and a poet. And um, I think permaculture is, uh, other people have said this before, permaculture is a great exit strategy for the arts. Permapoesis is um, something I developed just to start to, as a way of, of a modernist being, a person shaped by modernity's imperatives of capital and legalism and all the things that sort of bind us and form us um, and sort of reduce us as well, I, I believe, um, to becoming more expansive again, to becoming more of like a walking biome that we really are. We're walking biomes. We have more non-human cells operating on us than human. Um, the, the, what medicine has, medicine, um, medical science is, uh, Western medical science, I should back up a bit, um, is quite reductive, as we all know. Um, it, you know, it does its best. It, it, it fixes us when we put a chainsaw through our leg, which happened to me once. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm so thankful uh, for, for that. Um, but, you know, in many respects, our sciences are very reductive and they're based on um, quite simplistic uh, narratives and dogmas. Um, quite, quite similar to um, simplistic dogmas um, found in other parts of human thought, such as religion and the arts, um, poetry even. Um, the great thing about poetry that saves us from too much reductionism is that it's absolutely unfunded. Um, but what I thought of doing, rather than uh, just um, speaking straight off the cuff, a friend of ours, or a new friend of ours called... Um, friends of ours called Jordan and Antoinette from Happen Films, who are a um, really great emerging young filmmaking uh, group that are operating on virtually zero money. Um, they're really showing how they can reach large audiences on a budget of zip. And um, they, they made a film about us. They came in March and it aired today. Um, it was launched today. It's just 10 minutes and it kind of goes into our house household and a little bit of our community economy. Yeah, so I thought we'd start with that. Um, just to give an insight, go into some of the little areas, the biomes, the systems um, of how we live. Um, it's taken about 10 years, I suppose, to of dedicated focus to arrive where this film um, uh, sort of stops for a moment. And... Uh, it's, it's, it's just a, a small insight into, I guess, how we live. And then I'll come back to the rest of the talk and talk about some de more details, a bit of story, and then Meg and I are really keen to hear your questions. And Meg will probably heckle um, and remind me of loads, loads of stuff I'm forgetting as we go. Um, thanks, John. Has anyone seen... Uh, happened films before, uh, one of their films. Yeah, there's, there's, they're all mostly on, um, online on YouTube. You, there's some fantastic things there. One of my favourites is, a, I think it's called An Invitation to Wildness, where a couple, I think, who are now in their mid-60s, about 22 years ago, got access to some land, and it was completely bare and denuded um, without a stream running through it without almost a single tree. Um, it had a fallen down house on it and they fixed it up and it's now the most vibrant, alive food forest um, with many, many indigenous plants. Um, a stream has reappeared where actually um, fish, I mean, this sounds unbelievable, but um, it's really worth checking out this film. Um, so by just reforestating that degraded land, that stream ecology has actually extended right up into those higher reaches, which is just extraordinary what you can do in 20 years. 
And I think, you know, in a way, um, when I think of myself as a young art student, I headed out um, after art school to a little place called um, Bell's Creek um, between Braidwood and the Araluan Valley. And some lovely hippie landlords uh, who had moved back into Canberra to do uh, schooling, really, for their teenager, um, uh, loaned us, rented us, rented really cheaply a couple of artists fresh out of um, uni to go and live um, on, a, on a block that they, on a 22 acre block that they regenerated by just letting it go, by just actually attending to um, dominant weed species, but pretty much, and a little bit of planting around the house, but pretty much letting it go. And so by the time Mel and I went to live on this property, it, it was a, a flourishing ecology. It was a remarkable ecology. So just to bear that in mind, I know that's a bit of a segue away from, say, the household and community economies, but it's, it's also very close to, to the sorts of things we can do. Not, I don't mean on large properties, um, necessarily, but in our streets, on our street verges, in our backyards. Um, I was in, um, uh, I was at a meeting on the weekend in Carlton at a place, at my friend's place, whose dad in the 1960s got hold of this little old um, dwelling uh, uh, cottage. And there wasn't a single tree in this street in Carlton in 19, late 1960s, early 70s. And this dad of my friend Maya Wards um, uh, was a bit of an environmentalist and he got this big uh, movement in his street to, to plant indigenous trees all the way along it. And I didn't know that story until I left the next morning to go and catch a train. And I walked along this street in Carlton and it was so green and I hadn't noticed that before because I didn't have the reference of just how barren it was beforehand. And I think those stories are really telling. What legacy are we, what, what are we leaving um, behind? What are we leaving for the next generation? And I think becoming a parent um, a really, for me, um, crystallised in my mind that I am now part of succession. You don't have to be a parent to understand that, but for me, I had to become a parent to really understand ecological succession and cultural succession. What culture are we leaving behind? What ecologies, what biomes are we leaving behind? What, what's, what world are we leaving behind when we make room for other people to come forward? And I mean, and that leads us to death. Um, as a culture, we almost have no conversations around death. And yet, by the time we're young teenagers, um, our mortality starts to um, throb. <laughs> in front of us and all sorts of things happen in our cortex, um, sending sort of panic, uh, panic messages around the fact that we're going to not always be here. And um, I feel that sustainability um, is, the, the, or the lack of sustainability, um, maybe not in this room, not with the projects that are going on in Geelong, courtesy of you good folk, but certainly in the, in the um, in the centres around Australia and, and around the world where sustainability isn't really, it's just a word that people use, use mainly in business to make sure that business is sustained um, at the expense of everything else. So, I, you know, I think, I think, I, and I think maybe that's my um, poet perspective. Poets are obsessed with death. And, and like for some reason, I, I grew into a poet. Um, and so that was my entry into ecology because things must die in order to make more life possible. We must have decomposition. We must have decay in order for renewal, in order for new life. And so as I get older, I'm 50 in a couple of years, um, these, the, the sense of, of how I want to die and, how, and what I want to live behind is, becomes more and more um, fascinating and, and the potential for, um, the potential that the unavoidable fact of death provides us with. I want to sort of leave that for a moment hanging in the room, like the potential of our death. Wouldn't it be boring? 
to not die or to live for hundreds and hundreds of years. We would not have, we would not have great poetry for ex for a start. Um, we wouldn't have um, we wouldn't have interesting culture. We wouldn't um, we wouldn't have the anxiety um, around our mortality that can really um, engage us. And so, I guess our story, our household story, looking at um, the return that needs to be made. So the, the, the end of the bin liner, the returns to the worm farm, the returns to, to, to the dog, who, who plays a, a really important role, an ecological and, and loving and cultural role in our household. Um, I want to bless Zero here for a sec. Um, the, 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 the way in which we put back, the way we return gifts, is something that's become extremely important to us as a household and also in our community. Um, and that work has really been um, made conscious to us by Sue Dennett and David Holmgren's work as elders, as our living elders in our community. And we're so lucky to have those two. But these elders, Dave and Sue's, are everywhere in our communities. They're here in this room. Um, we have these elders that are actually performing eldership, which is absolutely wonderful. And yet, that eldership is often sidelined in a world of um, speed and glamour and, um, you know, so-called elders having facelifts and trying to, to forever hold on to youth. Um, it's, very, it's very tragic. As a, as a sort of middle-aged person looking at an eldership that is, is very sort of corrupted and contaminated, um, that we, you could just follow, follow that story and, 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 and be very depressed in that story, particularly when you look at our politicians and the way that they're performing. Um, there is virtually no eldership in our political system. There's, you know, true eldership. That is those who are, who, who are also not just involved in birth and growth and um, consumption, but those true elders are also involved in decomposition, death, so renewal can take place. And I think that when we start to think ecologically as a culture, we, um, we must also foreground decomposition, decay. And how we've done that in the household is to turn to things like fermentation. Because, um, and Meg's fermentation table, which is sort of the hub and lifeblood of our, um, of our house, um, and her teaching um, uh, fermenting at a monthly uh, culture club, and Meg gets a whole lot of uh, teachers um, from, from the, the Shire and further afield to talk about all aspects of fermentation. Because fermentation is the holding up of death it is the honouring of death, the decaying of vegetables. It's rotting vegetables. But um, using chemistry to make that decomposition extremely good for our microbes. And I think once our education system catches up with what's happening in science at the moment, in non-reductive science, that is... Um, I think, and, and I think the microbiome and study into the microbiome has, has really posed a great question for science. We are much more than the sum of our parts. We are so connected to everything else. And that what we are finding, or what scientists are finding, is that the more we touch, if we're in a city environment and we touch the ground and um, you know, there, there is very little biology, we are going to get sick. And that's where Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, kicks in and the whole industry, the whole sort of chemicalised um, big pharma industry kicks in through Pasteur. But if we think about ecology in terms of um, substances that can take multiple microbes, mossy rocks, trees, diverse grasslands, our guts, our skins, um, 
animals. And we are touching all these multi-microbed entities and we are engaging with them. We are... The, the, the potential for health is... Um, to reclaim a human health is ginormous. And I think the, the Hadza people in, in Tanzania are a really good living um, demonstration of this. Um, about 600 species a year, around seasonal species a year, the Hadza people eat. But they don't just eat those species, it's in the procuring of those species and the engagement. So that particularly plants and animals, mushrooms, you know, things like honey, the handling of these things, it's not just what we put into our gut microbiome, it's what our um, skin microbiomes handle, what, what we touch, works its way into a, a, our enteric system, which is our gut system. So re-fermenting culture, if, if you want to take the microbial um, story of human health, that is, living in healthy environments in order to have healthy bodies. Rather than the idea that my body's a temple and, oh, I'll just get that organic packeted food over there and I'll get this over here, but actually creating biomes where we are re making returns, that we are putting back into those biomes and those biomes are gifting to us. That, I think, is what we've lost. And I think we've lost it through a loss of... Uh, a, for a diminished eldership, through a diminished eldership. So what we've tried to do in our household economy is just very simply take back what big corporations, what big um, pharmaceutical companies, what, what big agriculture, what big publishing, um, big everything has really taken from us. Uh, and that is uh, to live simply and in connection um, with multiple biomes, multiple ecologies, so that our house is a wild interior. Our fermenting table is a wilderness of many, 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 many uncountable numbers of, of microbes that benefit, benefit us. So now, obviously, every now and again, it's really great to reach to the chemist. Maybe once a year, we have to do that. And the chemist is there, that's fantastic. But if, if, we are, if we are really, truly going to fix the, 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 the great systemic problems of our culture, we need to, to, to go and visit the GP and the chemist when absolutely necessary and to be living a much more preventative um, uh, life. And the way to do that is, doesn't require huge, vast amounts of money. It actually, what we've found is that it, it has involved decoupling ourselves from the monetary economy because until we decided, or until we could actually do that, um, we weren't in a position, we were time, extremely time poor. So we, had, we did not have the time in order to start to put in the step-by-step -step procedures that got us to where we are 10 years later. 